blessed be the holy living God. Glory to God forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from 1 Samuel. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. When her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the table beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you would look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall neither drink wine nor toxicants, or, nor, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and, they, and the Lord remembered her. In her due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the, the godly, godly that are, that are in, in the, the land, land upon, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O oh Lord, you are my p portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures for everyone.
a reading from Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. This is the holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As he came out from the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Abide in me, Lord Christ, and I in you. Amen. Please be seated. As he came out of the temple, in case you missed where the setting of our gospel was this for this morning, we are at the temple, uh, just about midway through Mark, and of course, we know how the story ends, and this is a teaching that is uh, right sort of before uh, that start part of Jesus' story uh, is told in Mark's gospel. He comes out of the temple, and we know what he says. No one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And the disciples... Being in a, a, ancient, a culture that was very much uh, uh, filled with apocalyptic end of times, the end is near, they want to know what is going to happen. And so they ask him privately, tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign and all of all, that all these things are about to be accomplished? 
they seem to be no different. I love the humanity of the various disciples that we hear and we get a window into because they're really no different than you and I. And I take comfort in that. They too uh, are reflecting humanity's fascination, it seems, certainly in that gospel that we heard. But you can look throughout so many stories and literature of so many ancient worlds and this sort of fascination and uh, trying to predict um, the end of times, which is technically called sort of an apocalyptic mind frame or, or uh, uh, set a uh, way that your, your mind is set and how you approach the world. It was sort of in the waters that they were swimming in. And this was for the disciples. And here we are 2,000 years later. And I feel like that there is so much of that, at least as I experience it, in our world today. It's a common thing we like to talk about and wonder about when, what are the signs? And when will this all come to an end? And what will it look like? Um, of course, there's radio shows that are about this. There's all sorts of stuff on the computer as well. And there are books that are written about this as well. Um, and so I, I, I can't really address this gospel and what I believe Jesus is calling us to um, without telling you that this gospel is known as sort of the little apocalypse. Uh, and it just seems fitting that... Um, you know, Jesus does need to address it because it's such a part of the culture that he lived in and his people that followed him and knew of him lived in. But it seems to be sort of a question, a larger question that we through humanity have wondered about for centuries and centuries and centuries. And I find uh, that there's a difference between uh, fantasy and apocalyptic writing and prophetic apocalyptic writing. And you see straight away in the gospel that we heard this morning, after Jesus tells, the, they ask the question of when this will happen, he immediately says to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say that I am he. But he's saying basically, be very, very weary. And so I have a little bit of that ringing in the back of my head when I hear of apocalyptic series of books like the Left Behind series that was popular when I was in high school and college uh, growing up. Um, if you're not familiar with that, I suspect many of you are. Uh, there was another book, the beginning series that I read um, called The Harbinger that came out in 2012. And it was all about the end of time signs from post 9-11 that the end of the world had begun. And these were the signs and this is how we knew it was happening. And again, I love a good fantasy book. I think the challenge and the problem for me is when we look at what could be fantasy and try to say that it's prophetic and predicting. Uh, and because I think the distinction is when you start to have fear that is a result of a, a book that is written or a series that is written, then somewhere it, be, it, it takes it out of the fantasy world of imagination and puts it into that prophetic part that starts to impact people's lives. And um, it's concerning to me because um, there seems to be an amount of fear that comes with that. And oftentimes the idea of being controlled um, and using as a manner of control and sort of predicting prophetically that this is what God has said is going to happen uh, from one particular focus. And, and I think it leaves out so many other pieces. Fantasy, no problem. Prophetic literature that we use and, and, and we use as a sort of a fear base, it's, it's problematic. So how do you know the difference, right? Um, I think for that, we have to sort of step back and say, okay, um, am I feeling fearful? Is my heart feeling fearful? Am I um, starting to sort of close in and get worried? Or um, am I doing the opposite of that? Because I think one of the bigger things that we have to remember in the meta narrative that we have through the gospel, one of the most oft repeated phrase um, 
in, in it's either two words or three words, depending upon which gospel it shows up in, is fear not. Or when the angel Gabriel came and visited Mary, be not afraid. So anytime I start to find things that are uh, being used as the word of God or, or sort of skirting on that and, it's, and, it, and it borders into that being fearful place, I have to remember, wait, the, you know, there's a bigger piece to this. And that I believe that is what Jesus has called us out of, not to be living in fear or distracted by fear, because when we do that, we get sort of frozen. It's like we get stuck in that amygdala part of our our brain, that reptilian part of our brain, that is the fight, flight, or freeze, right, safety piece. And certainly that's there for a reason. We haven't evolved to where we are in our world today without that as humanity. But I believe Jesus is calling us beyond that fight, flight, or freeze. And it's calling us out of that fearful place and into that uh, broader place of love, of openness. You can't do that if you're fearful and you have a closed fist and a closed heart. So when I look at this gospel, Jesus isn't denying that the end times are coming, however they understood that then, however we understand that now. Uh, you, you know, yes, you could say in ways maybe they, they've already begun. I, I don't know. Certainly suffering is a part of our world. The world has been sort of set in motion, and we as humans don't necessarily always make the best choices, and that is the result of suffering. But then the world is just in motion naturally. And it has sort of a life of its own and the weather and, the, and how our earth continues to change and form and reform and events happen from that. That is real. That has always been there. Suffering was there with Jesus. We see him reach out to those people who were suffering over and over and over. Not as a way to scare them, but a way to draw them towards him rather than frighten them them. He's saying there is actually a new path. What if that's what he's saying in the gospel reading today? Because this is the end of what he says at the end of Mark's um, gospel. He says, this is but the beginning of the birth pains. So what if it's not the end, the end of times? That the world is, is going to uh, everyone, or some will be swept up and taken away, and some will be left behind. What if it's not really about that to begin with? What if it's instead Jesus calling us to a new path, to a new understanding of how we could look at what uh, apocalyptic understanding of the world is? What if it is really about leaving the empty practices behind. Those things and ways of following life that we do the right thing, that we try to reach the goal, that we follow the letter of the law, but not necessarily the spirit. We do all those things right so that when the end of time comes, we'll know we're safe. But in the midst of doing that, what we're missing and distracted by is what it means to live life right now and how we find our way together right now because we're so distracted or I can become so distracted and fearful and stuck and closed off and turned in and my fist is this way rather than being open to God and where God is calling me through Jesus. What if it's more about that than how we make it through to get so that we can go to that place, wherever that place is that uh, we're told we need to get to? We see Jesus address this throughout the gospel about this new way of being together. And I believe that's what he's saying is not that the temple will fall down when all of these blocks fall down at the beginning of the gospel, but what he's saying is those empty practices that aren't helpful, 
that aren't drawing you toward me and toward each other there in that, those are what need to be let go of. What if that's what it's really about? No matter what is happening around in the rest of the world, that we are to be drawn to God and not turned in to ourselves, but drawn to God and to each other? What if we use our energy and turn it from the distractions and the predictions and the what if and put it toward that drawing into God through ourselves and being open to where God might take us and being open to each other? What if it's not so much that we need to be afraid and that we need to live in fear of what might come in the end of times, but rather acknowledging that in ways that is already happening, we're closer to whatever that is day by day, but in reality, what if it's not a bad thing as long as we're with God? And so this got me to thinking about a song that I often turn to, a piece of music that I turn to. And many of you all know this, that song and music is a prayer for me. Um, oftentimes when I'm driving, um, and it somehow it centers me and it grounds me and it reminds me and it connects that, that heart and that head together. And so thinking about this idea of this apocalypse as not being a distraction, but as something that I am being drawn toward God, it reminded me in a way of um, two words that you wouldn't really put together. And it's a song by the name of the Waylon Jennings. One day I'm going to see him in person. Uh, it, they take a lot of their pieces and inspiration from gospel music. Um, the intentional name, yes, is, is, is a drawback to Waylon, Gen uh, Waylon Jennings. Uh, but they have um, a song that you would not put these words together typically. But it sort of made me think, what if? What if it's not the apocalypse is something to be afraid of, but what if God can sing us a lullaby as we make our way through the apocalypse? the apocalypse of our lives and however that looks, and look at it not from fear, but as a way to journey through God on our way. And so I'd like to share with you just a couple of verses of the text. It's a hauntingly beautiful song. I do encourage you to go and, and listen to it. It's called, uh, like I said, um, Lullaby, or Apocalypse Lullaby. It says, hurricanes will come and go, earthquakes break the walls, oceans rise, empires fall. Into the world, light unshown, follow heart, follow home. Here we are, light unshown, one round heart, one round home. Faster than a ship, further than a bomb, see the glowing grid. Send love throughout the throng. Enter world, light unshown. Follow heart, follow home. Here we are, light unshown. One round heart, one round home. Fear not, be not afraid, says Jesus over and over in the gospel. Follow your heart, follow your home, as this song reminds me. It's not that we're following our heart and being drawn to God through our heart in sort of a cheesy, sort of easy, flimsy, like kind of Hallmark card that says I love you and, and all of those ways, which are good and wonderful, but I'm talking about something more than just the heart. Because in the Jewish tradition, the heart and the mind are used interchangeably, that they are connected. It's a seeking heart. As our baptismal prayer reminds us when we pray for those who are baptized and newly baptized, give them an inquiring and a discerning heart. 
And our heart isn't just any heart that can take us home and that can draw us closer to God, but it is a heart that is implanted with a piece of Christ. It is a heart that has been restored with Christ's incarnation. It has a piece of God in each of us through Jesus Christ, that this is the heart to follow, that this is the heart that can draw us home towards God. It's not a heart that is closed in and closed off, but a heart that does the hard work of being present, of inquiring, and of discerning, of always listening, where am I being drawn to God, and am I being distracted by fear, and encouraging us and giving us a pathway, as the Gospels say, do not be afraid, but instead Follow your heart, your heart of Christ that is in each of us, one by one. And together, together, as the Wayland Jennings say, we will find our way home. Each of us with our round hearts, our full hearts, we will find ourselves more at peace and more open, worrying not about the distractions of what the end of times might bring, but rather resting in God's heart and each other's heart as we find our way home right here and right now on this round earth together. And what may be, may be. But in Christ's heart, we know that we can find a peace that passes all understanding. And for that, I give thanks. So beloved, follow your heart, follow it home. Trust that Christ's heart is in you just as it is in your neighbor. And together, we will make it there. Amen. Please rise and let's reaffirm our faith in the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, from God, light. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all our people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are our loved. For this community, the nation, and the world, especially President Joe Biden, Governor Kevin Stitt, and Mayor Stan Booker. For all who work justice, freedom, and peace. 
for the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, especially Al, Alexander family, Anita, Beatty family, Blake W., Bob, Caroline, Charlie, Damien, Ed, Felicita, Fred, Hamlin family, JD, Jean, Jerry, Jim C., Joe, John, June, Catherine, Lucille, Mary R., Mott's family, Mrs. Stahl, Pat B., Regina, Richard, Sandra, Sharon, Sherry, Stephanie B., Steve B., and the Williams family. Those who minister to the sick, homeless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, and Paulson Reed, our bishop and all bishops and other ministers, especially the Church of the Holy Trinity, Fray Bentos, Uruguay. For all who serve God and, and his church. church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially birthdays for Craig Billingsley, Walter Archibald, Stephen Johnson, Joe Ruffin, Catherine Edney, and Leo Martinez. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, especially Nicholas Williams, Reverend Stephanie's cousin's son, and Margaret Brown, Pat Brown's daughter-in-law. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by the our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Are your, are your two adults in the back? Okay, okay. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. I would uh, highlight just one piece that we do have a lectionary-based Bible study. Lectionary or the uh, readings are the appointed readings for each Sunday uh, that we have on a three-year cycle. So because we are a um, liturgical church, uh, we follow a, a prescribed lectionary uh, along with several other denominations in the Christian tradition. And so um, we'll be looking at those uh, over lunch from 10, 1210 to 1250 Tuesday here in the parish hall. Uh, there is also the possibility, if you're interested and you'd like to zoom into that, let me know. I'm assuming you know 
you know, the whole, the whole possibility of Zoom, it has not left us just because we're out in a midst of living with uh, hopefully well beyond the, the pandemic with everyone um, being able to be vaccinated. Uh, and yet uh, some of those pieces of technology have not left us. And so if you'd like to zoom in for that, please let me know. Uh, so this coming Sunday, uh, those are the lessons we'll look at for Tuesday. Bring your questions uh, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. It'll be a short sort of lunch uh, focused time. Um, that's the one announcement that I do have in addition to welcoming uh, everyone who's here. If um, you're new to the Episcopal Church, uh, you'd like to receive communion, and um, certainly we're receiving at it this time, so you place your hands uh, out forward here. If you'd rather not receive the bread, but you'd like to receive a blessing, just simply cross your arms and I'll know to do that. Uh, I do know, in addition to that offering and welcome, we typically don't do this on Sundays, <laughs> but it is that time of year, and we are um, gathering our pledge cards for this coming Sunday. Uh, so bring them. If you haven't brought them already, we will be blessing them. And I believe Glenn had a couple things he wanted to say around that. So thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. It's wonderful to be with you all and uh, to gather together uh, and receive sustenance in so many different ways. And so um, I'm thankful to be able to do that as we gather at the Lord's table as well. Uh, uh, so please know um, that's one of the beautiful gifts that we in the Episcopal Church can offer. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due God's name. Bring offerings and come into God's courts.
please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, holy one of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy. Please dance it or kneel as is meaningful for you. Glory and honor are yours, creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You call the people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life. to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he brought gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory and presenting to you These gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. And grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people. of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and creator, in voices of, of unending praise. 
Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray together. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation, and you have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the peace of God, that passes all understanding. Keep your heart and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.